Let's start with the geometry sub palette and see what options we have in here. You might have come across my divide protect macro in some of my videos or in my gun road. And what it does is that it divides a model proportionally. So if, for example, I have, I use divide straight up from the geometry tab. And if you look at my model, when I press divide, you see that it lose, it lost some volume there. As I, as I divide even further, it's, it loses more volume. So what this divide button, along with these four different options, smooth art, prop one and prop two does, is that it allows you to divide your model in different ways. So prop one uses morph targets. And this is exactly the same thing as the macro that I showed you with a few optimizations. So if I use this one and I press divide, you see that the form, the shape is maintained. Now, smooth and art. If I press smooth here, it's the same thing as having this smooth button on and press divide. If I use art, it's the same thing as having this button off and pressing divide. Now, as you can see, hard will keep all the edges as they are. Now, the magic about this plugin is really the Prop 1 and the Prop 2. So Prop 2 doesn't use morph targets and Prop 1 does. So if you have a morph target, you're going to use it if you use the Prop 1. But you won't lose it if you use Proportional 2. But they give you different results. So you can use these four different algorithms to divide up your model. Now this button here, Divide Project, is a bit like the macro I have in my Gumroad project higher. So it divides using one of these algorithms and then presses the project button, which is the same thing as dividing and then pressing project all. And this is a way you can create good clear projections when you're projecting a high poly model onto a low poly model. And if you watch my video on, on that macro project higher, I'll show you a technique where you can use it. Now let's look at the next button and split the folder. It's a very simple button. It will split your model into polygroups to a new folder. So if I press split folder, it will ask me for the name of the folder. And once I press enter, the result I get is a folder with my model separated into different polygroups. So each polygroups goes to a different subtool. This can be very handy for certain workflows. Now this next option is a very interesting option, split keep edges. And this is for a workflow when you're working with really large scale objects, for example, a rhinoceros like we have here. And this can be so big that the detail that you want to add to it, it starts to get into millions and millions of polys. And you need to break it up into different parts so you can work on each part separately so that you can increase your poly count without burning up your computer. This is shown manually in a Flip Normals video and I'm gonna leave a link in the description for that video so you can see how you can do this manually. Now I'm gonna show you what Split Keep Edges does. Now if I press it, and this will work, I should point out that this will work for a subdivided model or a non-subdivided model. So if I press Split Keep Edges, it goes to my lowest subdivision, as you can see back there. And then it gives me this menu that will allow me to adjust my mask selection. And this mask selection will be an edge that will be created. So I can grow and grow by one or grow by two. And if I, if they start overlapping there, I can press reset and then do my adjustment again or shrink. And let's say I want my edge to be that thick. If I press OK, then what this will do, it will break my model apart and save one subtool as my edge subtool. So if I just select my edge subtool and I hide everything else. So now I have an edge there. And this edge was creased as long as well as all the other parts that I have here. So I have my model separated and I can work separately on all these parts. And if I bring everything back, I can now go in and sculpt in each individual part of my mesh. So I can sculpt here, sculpt there, sculpt anywhere you like. And then the purpose of the, this edge here 
is that if I want to sculpt on the edge, I can sculpt on this edge too. So I can create some... I'll just do some stuff here on the edge to exemplify. So I would sculpt here on the edge if I wanted to, instead of sculpting directly on this subtool here. So basically I would avoid the edge when I was sculpting in one of these separate subtools. And if I wanted to sculpt on the edge, I would go to my edge, my border, subtool. Now once I'm happy with it, and I'm just going to undo the stuff that I did on, on the separate subtools here. Now the only part that I have sculpted, just to demonstrate what, what's going to happen. The only part that I've sculpted here is the edge. And if I just turn off my polyframe here, you can see only the edge is sculpted. Now this works really well with the next button that I'm going to show you, in which, which is project to all. Now you know that when you project something, you'll pre you will be projecting every visible subtool to the selected subtool. Now project to all does exactly the opposite. It will project the current subtool to all the other visible subtools. So if I press project to all here, it's finished, so it says done. If I hide this subtool and I select any of the other subtools, you see that that border has been projected to all the other subtools. So the, the details that I add on that border have been projected to the different subtools and I get this result. So as you can see, these two buttons are very handy for this workflow or similar workflows. And Project to All is really a good addition to the projection option in ZBrush. Now you may be familiar with my thickness macro that I have in my Gumroad. And it's a free macro that you can get. This thickness button and the thickness slider, it's like an improved version of that thickness macro. And what it does is that it creates thickness on subdivided or non-subdivided models. So right here I have half a sphere. I cut half of the sphere out and I have a sphere here. So if I just turn on my polyframe here for a second so it's easier to see what's going to happen. And I press my thickness and I create thickness on my model. There's an inside area now and it's hard to see but there's a border there as well. Now if I undo that and I increase the size of my thickness, let's make it a bit bigger. Now you can see exactly what's going on. So you created that thickness. Now if you use panel loops or you use my thickness macro and you press thickness when there's no open edges, it will create some floating planes there that won't be desirable. With this thickness button, it will just say this subtool has no open edges. Now this this button will also account for any subdivisions that you have and it will do the maths on and give you the right subdivisions for your thickness. Now let's look at this sharpening area here and let's say I want to sharpen an area. I'm gonna look at the sharpen button first and if I just unmask an area here and I press my sharpen button just zoom in a little bit. You can see that we'll sharpen that area out and just that area that is unmasked. So you can use sharpen to char sharpen certain areas of your model like that. Really easy. Now you also have sharpen mode and sharpen mode uses morph targets so it will display a message if you have a morph target. Now when you press this button and you use your shift key just smooth out this area here and then when I let go of my shift key you can see that it inverted whatever I did to this area. So I smoothed out this area so I inverted it and it made it sharper. Now it's important as soon as you do this you turn off your sharpen mode because if you start using the undo option or doing some other stuff it, it will break this sharpen mode. Now even though it's called sharpen mode it can be used it can be used for other things we have a morph target. So if you have a morph target, you'll get something like this. You can press skip till next restart. It won't bother you again, just like anything in ZBrush. So I'll just do the same thing here. And as you can see, I have some more. He gets that area a lot sharper. Maybe there. So it sharpens up the area because I'm smoothing it. 
you can use this button in a creative way using other stuff. So if I change my secondary brush by something else, for example, if I press shift and then I click H polish, H polish is now my secondary brush. See, I'm pressing shift and you can see the H polish in my secondary brush. So if I use sharpen mode with secondary, with the H polish as my secondary brush, it will do the same thing. So if I polish this area down, once I let go of my shift key, it will invert that polish. So you can use different brushes and come up with different stuff. It's a bit like pressing Alt on a brush and it inverts that, that, that brush, but here you're using a secondary brush, so it can give you different results here. Now let's look at the positioning sub palette. And we start off with the views section that consists of six buttons with six different views, top, right, front, bottom, left, back. And when you press one of these views, for example, top, the first time you press it, it will focus your active sub tool. If you press it again, it will display your whole scene on a top view. By your own scene, I mean all the visible subtools will be displayed on a top view. Same thing for, goes for right, for front, back, left, right, top, and bottom. Now, if I remove some of these subtools from here, and I press top again, you see it frames all your subtools in the view that you selected. So if I only have one subtool selected and I press my top view, it will frame that subtool. So these buttons can be quite handy when you're trying to go to a specific view and frame everything that is visible in that view at the same time. Now let's look at grid snapping options. This allows you to snap any object to your grid and control your grid size and measurements. Now these me measurements, centimeters, millimeters, feet, inches, they're not exact science because ZBrush has many scale options and right now the scale is one but if you change this export scale it's, it's not gonna be it's not gonna add up with the proper centimeter or millimeter or whatever option you choose here so this is more like a guide now your grid size controls your grid size so you can really small grid or really really huge grid let's keep it at five and I'm just going to leave centimeters on this one. Now, let's look at this grid snap and the XYZ. Now, when you turn on grid snap, and before I do that, I'll just turn my gizmo on so we can see what's happening. You can control your snapping on the X, Y, and Z axis. These three buttons will allow you to choose which axis you want to snap to. So you can just snap to one or the three all together at once. Let's leave the three on for this example. And when I, when I press grid snap here, the way it works is when this is pressed, every time I let go of my mouse button or I stop pressing my pad with my pen, it will snap to one of the grid positions. I can use my views to go to a different view and snap it. For example, let's go to the right view are actually the left view and as you can see there's a grid already set up for us and if I turn grid snap off that grid goes away whatever settings you have on your floor and your grids and you can control that by going to draw and going to floor here you can control where you want your grids so whatever grids you have available here it will go back to that state once you let go of grid but when you have grid snap on the three grids show up so that you can control this so I can snap it here I can go to a front view snap it like that top view snap it like that like I said the way it works is once you release your mouse it will snap to the closest point in the grid and you can control if it's feet for example, if I press feet, it snaps right away to the closest feet distance. Millimeters, inches, centimeters. Now, every time you do a mouse up event, the script will be triggered and it will try to snap the object to the grid. So make sure you turn off grid snap once you're done with it. Now, let's look at align and nudge. 
And these two options, they were created from a script that I found in the, Z in the ZBrush Central. So, so credit should be given to who built the first version of this script. And in ZBrush Central, if you, if you write down Positioner and press Enter, you'll find this post from October Arts. And he created a script that is a, a first version of what I have here. I built upon it and I created some new options and changed it a little bit. And what this does, let's look at first at the line. So the way it works is that you select a tool that is going to be the driver and you press this set alignment driver button. So this cr made this cube, this big cube, the driver. Now I can select another tool and this is with the selected option on. I can select another tool and these colors here represent the X, the Y and the Z axis. As you can see in ZBrush, you have the red, the green for the Y axis and the blue for the Z axis. So, and the little dots show the position where we're going to make the alignment. So right now, the red axis, if I press this button, this will snap the subtool to the outside of the positive X. The positive X is this direction, to the left. So if I press this, it will snap to the outside position. If I press this one, it will snap to the inside position there. If I press this one, it will snap to the center, and so on. Now the blue, we can also see the blue, so if I, for example, place this in the center of the axis, and now I check the blue, and a way we can do this that makes more sense is like this. So the blue is the same thing. Center, inside, and the outside. Now if I make it go to the center there, you have the green. And the green I decided to place it like this. It makes more sense. So the green is the y-axis, up and down axis. So there, there, center, and below. Now I can select any other subtool and use the same functionality because this is the alignment driver. It was set once. So until I set another alignment driver, this will always be the alignment driver. And whatever subtool I press and then use these buttons, that subtool will be aligned to it in the manner that I choose here. Now I added functionality to this plugin by using visible and all, which means that I can align all visible subtools or all subtools. So let's hide some subtools here. I'll just leave those two on. So if I press visible, and remember, this is still my alignment driver. I can press this again and make sure it is my alignment driver. Let's go to the X axis and see how this works. Okay, so this is the blue axis, and if I say I want to center it on the blue axis, which is the Z axis, all the visible subtools will be centered on the blue axis. Okay, if I go back to these subtools and just, just undo this, now I can try the red axis, which is the X axis, and they'll be snapped to it like that. And if I bring up my other subtools, you can see they're still in the same position. And you can use the same thing for all. So if I press all, then all subtools, even the visible and the not visible ones, will be aligned. So let's align them all to the X as axis. Boom. Everything is aligned there. And also I have the green one like I showed you before. Let's go to the top, align everything to the top of this subtool. And there we go. Everything is aligned there. So this is a really handy feature. Now let's look at Nudge. And the way I created Nudge is that Nudge doesn't need a lot, an alignment driver. Whatever subtool is selected, Nudge will use that to determine by how much it's going to nudge. So, for example, if I use... I have these sections here and this means that I will nudge 
by 16 the size of the current subtool, by eighth, by fourth, by half, or by one unit. Let's let's check out one unit. And then we have these arrows here. So remember red, it's the x-axis. Blue, it's the z-axis. And green, it's the y-axis. So if I move it on the x-axis, I move it by one, and one is the full size of the subtool. If I go to half the size, you can see that it's moving by half the size of the subtool. And so one, 116 is just 116, one eighth is an eighth, and a quarter of the size. Then you have the blue, so on the positive blue axis, which is where the arrow is pointing out, or the negative. And the same thing goes for the green, so you can move it up and down there. So nudge visible in nudge all will nudge all the subtools by the size of the currently selected subtool. And let me exemplify that. So I have visible and right now I'm just everything is visible so it would be the same as having all here. So if I move if I nudge on my x axis on the negative and that would be on this direction so to the right here if I nudge this and I got all the visible subtools, everything will nudge by the size that is currently selected here. And I said half the size of the currently selected tool. So if I say the full size of the selected tool, it will nudge by the full size of the selected tool. And this happens in every axis. So if we go to the blue positive, the blue positive is this direction, it will move in that direction. Same thing goes for green, so green positive would be up, actually negative, and positive will be down. So if I select, for example, this little square here, it will, and I say one, it will move by the size of that square, a cube actually. Now let's look at some of the options on the undo sub palette. And I just use positioning for this example. And I have a, a cube that has an undo history where I just change it, its position around. So I'm just going back in my undos. So it starts there. And if I go forward in my undos, I'm just changing the position. And this could be a sculpt with different, different stages where you have the creature in a position and then you add some horns later on and you have a bunch of undo positions here. And what these options allow you to do is to save some of those positions. The first two buttons allow you to go to the start and that's where you started with your sculpt and the end which is the last undo position and you can check the undo history here. So start is the first position and is the last position. Now I can I can save some positions on these with these switches here. So for example, I can store this position on A and then for example store this position on B and maybe store this position on C and store this position on D. I have the clear all button which will clear all positions and I can also clear a position by pressing a button again. So if I, if for example, this is my D position, I believe. So if I press this D button, then the position is clear and I can use another position for that D button. Now I can't remember which position I used for D, but there we go. This is, this is how it works. Now this A, B and C, D will flip between A and B or C and D. So A, and B. And I can see these two undo positions like that, easy, and C and D. Okay, if for example I clear my D position and I press C and D, I press the first time it goes to C position and then the second time I press undo D position is not set. Okay, so if I set it again then I can keep doing this. So this will allow you to see a sculpt in different stages using your undo history.
and then for example if i'm if i like this undo position here i can press new subtool and this will create a subtool from this position so if i press new subtool now i got another a subtool there that was saved so it's a quite a handy tool to work with your undo history